Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the next installment of the JKMRC Friday morning seminar series that take place here at the Indoor Pili Lecture Theater, um, as well as online. My name is Katerina and myself and Karina are co-chairs uh, of organizing the seminar series and are taking turns introducing the speakers this year. But before we start, on behalf of the University of Queensland and the Sustainable Minerals Institute, we'd like to respectfully acknowledge all traditional owners and their custodianship on the lens of which we all meet today. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Our speaker today is Christy Guerin, who recently completed her PhD at the Queensland University of Technology on mineralogical and geochemical differentiation in fire affected regolith. Prior to that, in 2016, she obtained a bachelor's degree in geology here at UQ. Uh, professionally, Christy has also worked as an exploration geologist and I'm going to get that wrong, Gerboise? Gerboise, yeah. <laughs> base metal project in the Northern Territory. Um, currently, Christy is a research officer at the Bryan Mining and Geology Research Center with the Mine Waste Transformation Through Characterization, otherwise known as MyWatch group. Uh, she's involved in a project on secondary prospectivity of critical metals in mine waste with a focus on sites in New South Wales. And today's presentation is entertainingly titled, Goodness Gracious, Great Balls of Fire, Why We Should Care About the Geological Impacts of Wildfire. Thank you. Thank you. Take it away. Thank you for that introduction. Um, as Katarina mentioned, uh, I recently completed my PhD just down the river at QUT. Uh, and the topic of my research there was how wildfires can impact surficial geochemistry and mineralogy. So I'll be talking a little bit about some of the um, outcomes of that research. And then in a bid to keep all of you non-geologists entertained, hopefully, um, I'll be talking a little bit about how those um, research findings can be used in different disciplines. Uh, so fires have first occurred on the surface of the earth 419 million years ago um, and a fun fact is that the first evidence of wildfire in the fossil record comes from a charred coprolite which is fossilized poo something I like to talk about at parties um, so under present day conditions about 3.5 to 4.5 million square kilometers are affected by fire annually and the maximum temperature that's ever been recorded at the soil fire interface is close to 850 degrees. So that's quite significant when we're considering um, that this is occurring in a surficial environment that's dominated by low temperature processes. So fires need three things in order to start and to propagate. And that is number one, an ignition source. Um, ignition sources have always existed on Earth. Of course, under present day times, we've got a lot of anthropogenic impacts. So uh, people start a lot of fires these days. We also see a lot of wildfires started by dry lightning. And historically, uh, before people came about, fires also started through things like volcanic eruptions and uh, meteor impacts. So things like the Younger Dryas impact um, was quite significant in terms of um, wildfires that occurred over about half of the globe. The second thing that fires need is a source of oxygen, and that is something that we haven't always had on Earth. And the third thing is fuel, and in this case that's biomass, and again that's also something that we haven't always had on Earth. So looking at the atmospheric oxygen, uh, we first started to accumulate oxygen on Earth after the Great Oxidation event about 2.2 billion years ago, but it really didn't start to accumulate in the atmosphere until the Phanerozoic. So this is just one model of um, paleoatmospheric oxygen. Um, there's many, many models out there for atmospheric scientists. Um, and we can see that beginning in the Ordovician, we start to increase oxygen in the atmosphere. Um, uh, slowly increasing up to this PAL, which is our present day atmospheric level, which is around 21% oxygen. Um, and from this, we see 419 million years ago in the late Silurian is our first evidence of wildfire in the fossil record. And this coincides with really the start in uptake of that um, atmospheric oxygen in the Silurian. Following this period, there's a bit of a dip in oxygen 
And actually what happens there is what's called the fossil, the charcoal gap. Um, and that's a gap in charcoal in the fossil record where we haven't identified any, any charcoal in the geological record at all. And that's potentially because we've got this little dip in oxygen happening here. And following that period coming into the Carboniferous, we start to see increasing oxygen encroaching on, on what we experience at present day. And that's when we start to see abundant charcoal in the fossil record. Well, the reason why we don't see fires back here in the ore division um, is because of this thing called the fire window. So this is lots of people's research all put together, but basically the minimum threshold for starting a fire is about 16% uh, oxygen. So below that, um, no matter how hard you try, you can't start a fire. Uh, in the green zone, we've got present day, um, the present day scenario where you can really only start a fire in dry biomass. So if we've got a, a wet rainforest, we're not going to ignite a fire. Um, once we start to get over about 25% atmospheric oxygen, that's when things get really interesting because it's hypothesized that you could ignite even a really wet amount of water saturated biomass. So potentially during these periods where we see really, really high oxygen, um, no evidence for this, but it's speculated that um, there could have been really, really intense fires during those periods. And this also correlates really nicely with our um, biomass availability. So the evolution of plants on earth. So in the late or division, we start to see the evolution of terrestrial plants, but they're not very big um, and there's not very many of them. So they take a little while to propagate. But coming into the late Devonian, um, we start to see the evolution of some bigger vascular plants. And that's when we start to see plants with real wood and we start to see forests forming. And after this period, there's really a huge proliferation of land plants. And that corresponds really nicely to this um, buildup of charcoal in the fossil record as well. So in the surficial environment, um, as I mentioned previously, it's dominated by low temperature processes. And what's happening in the surface normally, um, absent of a fire, is chemical weathering, um, where our fresh rock that's exposed to the atmosphere and to water is weathered um, and it's leached of all of the mobile elements. And the end result of this is a nice weathering profile where we see minerals like iron oxide, so things like hematite and gerthite, uh, aluminium oxides, if there's enough aluminium in your country rock. So things like gerthite, uh, sorry, gibbsite, um, clay minerals, so things like kaolinite, illite, smectite, and any resistant primary minerals. So those are things like quartz, titanium oxide, zircons that are left behind and can't be weathered. And this is just a nice example of a, a lateritic weathering profile, which is quite common in Australia. Um, and we can see here at the bottom, this is sort of fresh un unaltered country rock and it's slowly grading up to this heavily weathered top here. And in a lateritic profile, it's really common to see this nice hard cap here that we call a jury crust. This isn't the only kind of weathering profile, but it's one that was kind of important for my research. Um, so in a lateritic profile at the top, as I mentioned, we've got this nice hard iron rich crust. Um, and if there's enough biotic interaction in that zone, you've got, this is where you're going to see your soil forming. So if soil is present, it's going to be in those upper couple of, couple of metres of, of the regolith profile. And this whole thing is, is the regolith. Um, I tend to use the term regolith and soil interchangeably, which is not strictly correct. And I fervently apologise to any real soil scientists in the audience for that. Uh, but for the purposes of this, I'm just talking about the top up a couple of metres that are altered by fire. So fire has a number of different effects on geological processes that we already know about. Uh, so number one, there's a lot of geomorphological effects. So it can cause things like rock spalling. And this is a really nice paper that came out last year that actually found that fires seem to be quite significant in shaping Uluru. So this is the base of Uluru and there's a flared slope at the bottom. And this research actually found that severe fires were causing charring and uh, spalling at the base and causing this sort of flared slope pattern, which is kind of interesting. Uh, increased erosion is also a really big issue following fires and that happens because you're destabilizing the soil profile and changing the physical properties of the soil. So if there's a large rainfall event that can be quite significant and this is really important in mountainous areas. So this is a picture from Colorado and this is a debris flow that was caused by heavy rainfall following a wildfire. 
BIOT also has a really well documented feedback on the oxygen, carbon and phosphorus cycles. It can cause changes in mineral composition at temperatures of 850 degrees. That's really pushing into sort of metamorphic boundaries. Uh, and it also causes quite significant changes in the physical and chemical properties of the soil. And for my purposes, I think one of the most interesting um, ones of these chemical changes that we see in the soil is an increase in pH that follows a fire. And that perseveres for months to years following a fire. And it's caused from uh, the combustion of the organic matter, which releases alkali cations into the soil and increases the pH. So this change in pH together with the change in mineral composition really has quite a potential to impact geochemistry in our soil and regolith. Um, and this is fairly well documented in terms of nutrient elements because that's quite important for the recovery of the ecosystem following a fire. But it's not really looked at in terms of things like potentially toxic elements. So things like um, copper, cobalt, chromium, zinc, um, a little bit of work in that sphere at the moment, uh, but really not looked at at all in terms of other trace elements or rare earth elements. And that's really what I wanted to know from this research. So I just want to talk. Sorry, I'm electrical taped in. I just want to touch a little bit on some of the pyrogenic mineral assemblages that we happen to see following a fire. So as I mentioned, fires generate temperatures up to 850 degrees, and this is well and truly high enough to start causing mineral phase transformations in the soil. And what we see is things like gerthite, so that's quite a low temperature iron hydroxide dehydroxylates forming hematite. Uh, kaolinite is a very ubiquitous clay mineral, and we form a mineral called metakaolin. Uh, if there's gibbsite present, it can form a number of these uh, sort of nerdy looking formulas and I won't get into detail about them. If you want to ask me and you're interested in mineralogy, it's super cool, but I, I don't want to put you to sleep. But we call these the transition aluminas and essentially they culminate in corundum at about 1200 degrees. And uh, if there's organic matter in the mix, what we get is a sort of partially reducing environment. And then we can form a mineral called maghemite, which is a partially reduced iron oxide. Maghemite is magnetic, so it's really easy to identify in the field. You can just pick it up with a hand magnet. So these minerals are not typically formed during surficial processes. If we identify things like maghemite and transition aluminas in our soil at regolith, then we might start to say, hey, there's been a fire here that's affected this. So from this, what are the big questions? Really what I wanted to know is, can we better define the geochemical impact of wildfire? And as I mentioned, a lot of this is known in terms of nutrient elements, but not a lot done on trace elements. So the big question is really, what on earth do we study for this? Um, so paleo fire research focuses a lot on fossil charcoal. Fossil charcoal is notoriously dif difficult to preserve. It's really light, it floats away in the wind, it floats on water, it gets washed away in erosive processes. And then if it does happen to be buried in the fossil record, it's kind of hard to identify. So I, this is where the balls of fire come in. Balls of fire are ferruginous nodules. And these little guys occur in the top of a weathering profile. So coming back here in the upper couple of meters in the soil, or if there's no soil, they can form at the top of that jury crust in, in the weathering profile. And these guys have a really nice, typical low temperature weathering mineral assemblage. So they have things like iron oxides, they can have gibbsite, they have clay minerals, they have quartz. And they're these really hard, durable, handy little packages that don't tend to get uh, broken, they don't tend to get weathered very easily. Um, and they come in magnetic and non-magnetic varieties. Surprise, the magnetic varieties are quite commonly cited to have been caused by fires. And because, because they're magnetic, you can just go out in the field with your hand magnet and pick them up. So they're really easy to sample. So these are really handy, handy little um, samples that I've used to, to test some of these ideas. And they're pretty ubiquitous. So uh, ferruginous nodules tend, do tend to occur in um, areas of lateritic weathering. So that 
happens to be around equatorial regions, but we can also get them in more temperate climates. Uh, this is some, not definitely not all of the records in the literature of uh, ferruginous nodules. And I'll just point out that the ones in black are ones that have been uh, concluded to have been of, of um, fire origin and ones in blue, either that hasn't been considered at all or it's been ruled out. So taking my ferruginous nodules, I used all, all, all different sorts. I had ones from different places. I had real ones, I had artificial ones. I chucked them in the oven. I did XRD on them to look at the mineralogy. I did geochemistry, laser ablation, wet chemistry. I looked at them under the SEM to see what they looked like. Did thermogravimetric analysis. I did a couple of different leaching studies. Um, I took them to the synchrotron and made some pretty pictures. And I don't know if I love or hate this slide because it so succinctly sums up four whole years of my life. But basically there's three main takeaways from all of this work. And that is the high temperature mineral assemblage um, that I found that there is accelerated weathering of metakaolin and that I found there is geochemical differentiation. Is that us? No. Oh, we're not being evacuated, it's, it's fine. <laughs> So the high temperature mineral assemblage. Uh, so this is from samples that I heated in the oven and then looked at in terms of their mineralogy. And what I was able to do was put together a kind of mineral parogenesis. Now I will point out, um, these have all been studied in isolation by numerous different people. I didn't discover any of these phases or the temperature of phase transformations. I just put them all together um, for the first time. So what we've got here is, uh, so when we have girthite at about 250 degrees, we form hematite. And then in the presence of organic matter, we have those partially reducing conditions. We form maghema at 450 degrees. One of the cool findings from the iron oxides here is this guy here, which is Luo Gufenga, I'm probably saying that wrong. Um, and that's a mineral that no one had ever heard of. I needed a lot of help to figure out what that was in my XRD. And it's actually a high temperature iron oxide polymorph. And it's only ever been identified in one natural sample ever on earth. And that's a Pleistocene basaltic scoria. These are, these are experimental samples, not natural. Um, this is quite interesting because if we were to find this in natural samples, then that might tell us that we've had fires of, of temperatures up around 900 degrees, which is higher than what we've ever measured currently. Uh, if we have gibbsite in our starting mix, depending on the grain size of the gibbsite, we produce a variety of these different transition aluminas. We can make corundum at quite low temperatures if there's diaspore, which is just another um, aluminium hydroxide phase. And it, when we have kaolinite in the mix, uh, we can get metakaolin at about 550 degrees. Um, the boxes shaded in gray just indicate ones that are X-ray amorphous. So they're not actually detected in X-ray diffraction. Um, so if you do have these phases forming, then you might see an increase in poly diffracting material in your mineralogy and be able to identify it that way. So I can then use that mineral parogenesis chart and start looking at real life case studies. So these are two sites with um, real magnetic nodules in the wild. So we've got uh, Weepa, which is up in far North Queensland, famous bauxite deposit, and Santa Cruz, which is in California. So looking at the mineral assemblage at these places in Weepa, the highest temperature mineral we have is metakaolin. So I can put a lower bound at 550 degrees for paleo fire activity in that area. Because I don't have luo gufengite, I can say that the fires never reached greater than 900 degrees. And similarly for Santa Cruz, uh, the, the highest temperature mineral I have here is maghemite. Uh, so the lower bound's at 450 degrees and again, upper bound at 900. And this is quite interesting going forward. So looking back at the global map of fire affected, or sorry, uh, magnetic nodules, um, can we use this mineral parogenesis going forward to revisit some of these sites to give us some more information about the paleo environment in these areas? And also these ones in blue where it hasn't been considered that they might be fire affected. Can we go forward armed with this information and make some new conclusions about these sites? 
So the second big takeaway was about metacaol and, and its increased dissolution from these fire affected samples. So I had a couple of really big issues with this research and it fell around this metacaol and issue. And in fact, this, this um, subsection in my thesis was subtitled the metacaol and problem for a long time until I figured it out. So in the wild, magnetic nodules are really hard. Um, I tried to crack a few open and they went flinging across the rock lab and we found them a couple of years later hiding under a table. Um, they're, they're really difficult to break. They're filled with this aluminous cement that fills up all of the cracks in the pore space and it's kind of glassy. Uh, some people have identified it as a transition alumina phase. It's really difficult to identify, so some people just say it's a glass. But interestingly, I was not seeing this in samples that I popped in the oven and heated up. The second big issue was that we know that there's dehydroxylation of kaolinite at 550 degrees. If I have kaolinite in my sample, I'll have metakaolin in the sample after I've heated it. But in the wild, magnetic nodules don't have metakaolin. And I could tell this from some thermogravimetric analysis I did. So if I know metakaolin should be forming, where on earth is it gone? And what's making the cement? Um, so, Metakaolin, if you're a geologist, might not sound that interesting. Uh, I had never really heard of it before, unless you work in coal seam fires or fly ash, you've probably never heard of it before. If you are a material scientist, it probably sounds pretty interesting. And like many great discoveries, this came about because I was up at 2am reading about material science and geopolymers instead of sleeping. But as it turns out, you can make you can make a transition alumina cement by leaching of calcined kaolinite, which is metakaolin. So then the alarm bells start going off. So I had put together a little leaching experiment to see if I could uh, see if this is what's happening in, in my samples. Um, what I did was I took uh, samples that had been heated and I popped them in either an alkaline solution or an acidic solution. So here the stars are HCl, and the squares are sodium hydroxide. And you can see that uh, under acidic conditions, the aluminium starts to be mobilized out of the sample into solution, but under alkaline conditions, it's quite immobile. Whereas for silica, it's roughly equally mobile under both acidic and alkaline conditions. And as it turns out, this is pretty well known in the materials industry that this happens. Um, so I didn't make any groundbreaking discoveries here, but it's never been seen in geological samples before. So potentially what we could be having is, as I mentioned earlier, uh, following a wildfire, we have pervasive uh, alkaline conditions for a period of time. What if we were incongruently leaching the silica from these samples, leaving behind an aluminous cement? This is a big question. My leaching experiment only lasted for one month, um, so not enough time to fully cement anything. I think a long-term leaching experiment would be quite interesting. This is potentially a new mechanism for the formation of cement in geological samples, and this isn't unique to nodules. This also occurs in fire-affected soils where you get like glassy aggregates occurring in the soil as well, completely changes the texture of the soil. This also has massive implications for our understanding of the global silica cycle. So if you're a geochemist interested in that, you might care about these findings. So lastly, the, big take, the last big takeaway was the geochemical differentiation that I found in these fire affected samples. So I took some samples, I heated them to different temperatures, and then I used weak acid extraction to look at what elements might be mobile following heating. And what I found was that heating actually increased the mobility of a lot of different elements. And this is really obvious in things like the alkali and the alkaline earth elements, um, in a lot of transition metals, so vanadium, scandium, chromium, cobalt, zinc, copper, all had increased mobility following heating. Um, and also in some typical geochemical ratios that we would normally use. So the rubidium strontium ratio um, is altered, uranium thorium, and lanthanum compared to other rare earths. So this is all quite interesting from an academic perspective, but, and I guess I thought when I started this that it was a bit of a niche topic, but really looking forward, um, we can apply these results to the big picture. 
so under present day conditions, we've got upwards of 4.5 million square kilometres affected annually. If we consider that the upper few centimetres are what's affected by fire, my back of the envelope calculations say that that's about 70 cubic kilometres per year of substrate that could be affected by this mineralogical changes and geochemical differentiation times that by 419 million years. And I haven't done that math, but that's a lot. And also looking forward through time, the, the most recent IPCC report showed that fire promoting weather conditions are more frequent compared to pre-industrial times. And they predict that the severity and intensity of fires are going to increase in the coming years as a result of anthropogenic activity. And I really think in this, that the key to understanding the future is understanding the past. So can we apply some of these geochemical findings to look back into the geological record, try to get a better understanding of how fire regimes have changed throughout time and throughout changing climate. Back to uh, the lovely paleoatmospheric graph. Um, during the late Carboniferous and the, sorry, the um, late Cretaceous, we have these really anomalously high um, oxygen levels. So you might predict that during this time we had more severe, more intense fires. Can we look back to that time and find some of these geochemical proxies in the geological record? So things like scandium, vanadium, chromium, arsenic and lead, and some of these geochemical ratios. But where to look? Marine shales have been used for a long time as paleofire records because they accumulate uh, charcoal from a really large catchment area. This is a really quick and dirty data mining mission where I gathered a lot of information about um, black shales throughout the Phanerozoic and plotted them up just to see if I could see an increase in some of these paleofire proxies during those periods where there was high atmospheric oxygen. So I've, I've um, put a line over when we should see these fluxes occurring. And as you can see, there's really nothing in it. Actually, the highest concentrations of a lot of these elements occur during the Cambrian, well before we ever had fires on Earth. Can we narrow this down a little bit? There's a lot of um, com complicated issues at play here in terms of how um, elements are delivered to um, sedimentary basins. Um, apologies online, I keep losing my microphone. Just. Can we narrow this down a little bit more so that we're not looking at such a broad area? This is one example of a black shale from the Appalachian Basin. And this occurs during the Middle Devonian to the early Carboniferous. So we're really sitting in this time frame here where we had quite low atmospheric oxygen, and then we're starting to really build it up. And we're also coinciding with that period of proliferation of terrestrial forests. So Coming up to the top of this shale, we see an increase in inert night content, and inert night is a type of coal that is derived from charcoal. And that corresponds quite nicely to vanadium and chromium contents in this core. Uh, this is a complicated situation. There's obviously a, a lot of reasons why we can fixate metals, especially when organic matter is involved. Um, so I think this needs to be looked into further. There's probably other things that need to be deconvoluted from the paleo fire signature, but certainly something interesting to look at. Another case study I looked at was Lynch's crater, and that's a volcanic crater up in the Atherton Tablelands in far north Queensland. And it has a near perfect sedimentary record for about the last 230,000 years. And the last, I think the upper 13 metres of core have been really well characterised in terms of um, charcoal, pollen, geochemistry. Um, in fact, the charcoal records from this location um, give us the earliest dates of anthropogenic fire in Australia. 
Um, so this is the last 55,000 years. And I will point out these two cores, the, these are two different studies. So the charcoal and the geochemistry were done on two different cores at two different places in the lake by two different teams of people. Um, so in the charcoal counts, we see a nice increase in charcoal at around 12,000 years ago. And then again, at about 14 or well, 39,000 years ago. And this sort of matches up to some of those paleo fire proxies. So scandium, yeah, vanadium, maybe chromium arsenic starting to fall off the wagon a little bit here. But while this looks like this is offset by several thousand years, this is really only one or two meters of core. And these are redox sensitive elements that have been buried in a peat mire. So there's a lot of room for them to mobilize after deposition. I'm not saying this is definitely a paleo fire cause here. Um, Mueller, who did this geochem work, did um, a principal component analysis to try to deconvolute the different environmental factors that were contributing to these geochemical fluxes. But unfortunately, their team never did charcoal counts, so that wasn't included in the PCA. I think going forward, that would be something that would be really interesting to do if you were to collect a really good sedimentary core, do geochem on it, collect charcoal data while you were there, and then you could look into that a bit further. So this is all very well and good from a paleoclimate point of view, uh, but I think this also has some other really big implications for other disciplines. Um, the geochem is really obvious, uh, especially in terms of the global silica cycle. Mineralogy, um, that little guy, Louis Gufenga, if, if we found that in a paleo soil or something like that, that would be really exciting because that means we could say that there's been fires that have been higher than present day temperatures in the past. That's my goal maybe, to go out and look for Louis Grufenga in the geological record. Uh, there's also a number of other takeaways that I think would be applicable to geochronologists, environmental geochem, uh, exploration, geology and minerals processing. So in terms of geochronology, when we date paleo wildfires, paleo wildfires, we rely entirely on fossil charcoal currently. And this is restricted to the dating range of radiocarbon, which is about 50,000 years. Anything that's older than that, we need to use stratigraphic correlation, fossil assemblages, things like that. So we start to get a little more inaccurate. These pyrogenic iron oxides that are forming are really cool targets for geochronology going forward if you were to want to date a paleo wildfire effect, event that's older, older than 50,000 years. We can date iron oxides using uranium series, uranium disequilibrium, uranium thorium helium, things like that. Um, in fact, a couple of people have dated magnetic nodules, but not considered that they might be partially reset by fires. So that's something that really needs to be looked look into going forward. Um, I've shown that there is an increase in mobility of uranium. Is it completely reset in terms of a geochronometer? That's something that, that needs to be examined further. And you also need to think about this if you don't want to date paleo wildfires. If you're doing cosmogenic isotopes, you could have rock spalling, which has lost the outer few centimetres of your rock. There's also a diffusive loss of uh, things like beryllium and chlorine, which are using for cosmogenic isotopes. Um, argon argon or potassium argon, if you're looking at historic data sets, and there could be um, quite significant diffusion of argon in these samples that have been fire affected. And also uranium lead, um, these results have shown that the mobility of uranium lead are both increased following a fire. So there's potentially some resetting that would occur there. In terms of environmental geochemistry, Fires have a really strong potential to increase the mobility of a lot of potentially toxic elements that used to be called heavy metals. Um, so things like chromium, cobalt, copper, zinc, lead. This is not usually a huge issue because most soils are pretty barren in terms of um, these potentially toxic elements. But if you were to have a fire affected area over remediated land, industrial waste, agricultural land, sometimes these can be quite high in a lot of environmental contaminants. So if you were to then remobilize these following a fire, that could actually be something that needs to be looked into. There's actually a little bit of work going on in this field already um, coming out of Southern Cross Uni, looking specifically at the arsenic and chromium mobility in acid sulfate soils. 
Um, another thing is a lot of these paleo fire proxies might be recorded in accretionary processes. So I've already mentioned the sedimentary records, um, but also things like corals and speleothems. So we could be looking at some of these accretionary processes, looking for some of these weird geochemical anomalies, and then being able to say that there was a period of fire. Um, and there has been a little bit of work come out of SMI and C's on this, uh, who um, Saha found that there was vanadium in corals that correlated to historic land clearing and burning. In terms of exploration, um, again, these same elements keep cropping up. Um, and these are quite often used as target elements or pathfinder elements in exploration geology. And a lot of commodities like um, porphyry, VMS, IOCG, lateritic stuff, they all use um, regolith lag sediment sampling in their exploration strategies. And this is really important in places like Australia, where a lot of our rock or our country rock is covered by this deeply weathered regolith. So the only way you can explore is to sample the sediment on the surface. Uh, so I guess my one suggestion would be to avoid fire affected areas if you can, if you're not sure, and there's iron oxides, which in Australia there usually is, you can take a hand magnet, check it for maghemite. If there's orthogenic magnetite, which is also magnetic, um, you might need to take a sample, do some further tests, maybe look at it under the SEM, do some mineralogy, see if you can find some other fire indicators, and then maybe avoid those samples. I can't say that they would be mobilized significantly, but um, I guess if you want to get the best out of your results, it would be best to avoid these fire affected areas. And lastly, looking at minerals processing, a lot of these mineral transformations that are happening can negatively or maybe positively affect some of the minerals processing. And this is, um, at least to me, most important in the bauxite processing industry. Um, so similar to what we see in the fires, there's actually already um, a bauxite process that uses a similar uh, method. So the roast leach method is used for high silica bauxites to convert kaolin to metakaolin, which is more readily leached. Um, and this is good. We want metakaolin. It's easier um, on the Bayer process and it costs less money. But as soon as we start to heat things and form metakaolin, we're also forming these transition aluminas and these are deleterious to the processing. Um, so that's going to increase your cost. So it's a bit of a balancing act. Um, and it's certainly something to consider going forward, especially in places like Weipa. Um, I've, I've not studied any other bauxite deposits, but Weipa is heavily fire affected. And Interestingly, this study actually found that um, the piezoliths from Weeper that were fire affected um, had high gibbsite and low bomite compared to the non-fire affected ones. So if you're in bauxite processing, um, that's great because that's what we want. We want lots of gibbsite because it's cheaper to process. And that's actually the opposite of what I expected to find, which is quite interesting. So finally, why should you care about fires? If you don't care already, I'm not sure I'm going to sell it to you, but I'll try. Um, charred coprolites. I don't know about you, but that's a fun conversation starter. Uh, a 419 million year history, anything that's older than the dinosaurs deserves my respect. But more seriously, that's a really long time and that's a really large cumulative impact to consider. These geochemical differentiation that's occurring and the mineral phase changes. Um, these findings can have some sort of wide cross-disciplinary implications, which I didn't expect when I started this project thinking it was so niche. So upwards of 3.5 million square kilometers affected annually, currently, this is gonna get worse. And as I mentioned, I really think the key to predicting the future is in better understanding the past. Thank you. Christy, that was fascinating. Um, a few aha moments for myself, actually. <laughs> um, do we have questions in the audience? Thanks, Kirsty. Great talk. I want to show myself off as a non geologist and general ignorant person. Um, but my immediate thought was the opposite. So presumably ice ages, glaciers, all those things are sort of the opposite of 
fire in some ways. Mm -hmm. Any comments on to those who may say maybe it's already known what those impacts are on geology and stuff, but not to me. So what about yeah other weather events and things like that? Are they like equivalent the in fires a fires during the ice age? No, no, no. Just like are there equivalent or changes to geology and the like because of ice ages? I'm sure there oh, are and you know thunder. So yeah. Can you give a brief overview of those? For people who have no idea, if you can, no. that'd be great. <laughs> I'm, um, do, do you know what? It's actually quite funny because I studied in Queensland. We don't have a lot of glaciated landscapes here. I really know nothing about ice ages. Um, yes, they did have a significant geological impact. Um, they cause a lot of geomorphological features um, because they move really slowly and carve things out. They drop rocks where they don't belong, which are called glacial erratics, which are really cool. Um, that's about the extent of my knowledge about glaciers, I'm sorry, <laughs> and ice ages, there are a lot of different um, climatic processes that, I mean, it's all Gaia, right? <laughs> Everything's linked together. Um, I could give you a lecture on that. It would be very long. <laughs> well, that's a great idea for um, potentially a future seminar, maybe find a speaker from Canada or something like that to talk about exactly that. So thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that was a fantastic talk, Christy. Thank I really you. enjoyed that. And I think you've certainly taught the audience a lot of things they didn't know. And you're probably the first person in the whole JK series to ever mention the word poo. So well done there. Um, several, several times. <laughs> um, but my question really was, I guess, an implication of your research. So, I mean, obviously, you've looked through the rock record, you've looked at changes mineralogically and structurally, you know, the implications that that could have on soils. Have you presented your research to, I guess, the agricultural community and sort of have they sort of bought into some of your research findings to think about how, you know, we obviously an increase in, in fires in Australia, how that might impact sort of future, you know, crop plantations, etc. So have you seen sort of that sort of connection with the agricultural community in Not terms really. of your... And is that something that you plan to do in the future? I think going forward, um, one of the things I got out of, I think someone told me that the thesis examination process is a nice learning process, that um, something that I learned from that was that I did have a really strong link between geology and soil processes, which I don't think I really realised. I just kind of did it and didn't think a lot about it. Um, and now I realise that, that, that I've actually drawn quite a significant link between um, pedology and geological processes. Um, Going forward, hadn't really considered it, but I do think this is quite important in terms of agricultural processes. There is actually already a fair bit of research, especially around um, places like Indonesia, where they do slash and burn agriculture. Um, and they have done a fair bit of research already in the past, especially around the mineralogical transformations and the textural transformations of soil in those places, because that's important for crop growth. Um, but they haven't really looked at this geochem um, so would the geochem differentiation have an impact on plant growth? Probably. Um, I think this is baby steps and there's a million different things we could do with this research now. Yeah. Yeah. I have a follow-up question and I think in a way you kind of answered it, but um, so as an exploration geologist and I've worked in Northern Territory as well and um, everything is sort of culturally burned there on a regular basis, several mm -hmm. times a year. And we were sampling termite mounds and who knows what yeah. um, on surface. Um, and so one of your um, recommendations is to avoid fire burned areas. I mean, but it's, it's impossible though, But right? it's impossible, that's yeah. right. So, yeah. so um, when you say avoid, um, like for how long? or like avoid in general so or? i guess you could we I, did uh, sorry we, we did wonder if we were wasting our time it's like yeah, what am i sampling yeah. But yeah you i mean i can't quantify exactly how much is going to be mobilized following the fire based on my research i can say that it's got increased mobility it's certainly something that needs more work done on it i you could like sample under the upper couple of centimetres because the heat from a fire really doesn't propagate very deep. Mm. So if you were to just sort of like get rid of the upper bit and then sample underneath, 
though there is bioturbation though I mean in areas like the Northern Territory that's not quite so significant as long as you're avoiding termite mounds because the grass is quite shallow um, so you do get a fair bit of turnover and you can get juxtaposition of fire affected next to non-fire affected stuff in the soil. Um, if you were really worried and it was a recent fire, getting rid of the upper five centimetres, you'd probably be safe. Um, but then again, if you've got leaching of mobile elements, where are they going to go? They're going to go down. So is that going to alter your geochemistry? Maybe. It maybe is my answer. And that's why I just said, if you can avoid it, um, but I think it's something that probably needs to be looked into, whether or not it is significant for exploration, because I know it's really common in Australia. Yeah. It's definitely what we were looking for was the mobile yeah. elements. Right? Yes, yeah, definitely. So, and I, I mean, they're still there. They're not completely lost. Um, lead is very volatile anyway. And that, um, that was like 70% leached, I think. So that's quite significant. Um, other ones sort of still left behind in certain amounts, but maybe you might have lost you know, a quarter of, of your concentrations to leaching. So, um, yeah, I think it's something that probably needs a bit more research. Excellent. Got a question online. Um, sorry if you already mentioned this, uh, but what natural surface leaching mechanisms do you think could be responsible for the cementation? Uh, oh, so that's the leaching of the metakaolin. So um, metakaolin is really reactive compared to kaolinite because uh, the crystal structure rearranges itself. So that makes itself really um, vulnerable to acid attack. So um, what we can get is um, if under alkaline conditions, we can have the aluminium remaining in the crystal structure and the silicate leaching out, leaving behind an aluminous cement. Do we have any more questions? We do. Um, thanks, Christy. I thought it was a great talk as well. Um, hopefully I can try and phrase this in a sensible way. I was really intrigued by um, your comment about the contribution of the charcoal from fires to black shells in the historical record. Um, I suppose my first question is, can you get a sense of how much of that, the carbon content of those black shells could be caused by uh, charcoal contributions and then kind of following question is if you went to a modern day environment where you'd be depositing uh, equivalent to black shells do you get a sense of um, the charcoal flux to those systems from modern day fires is that something that some of these um, drilling programs that you see people doing do they ever capture that information though they just haven't looked at it yet a lot do capture charcoal um this was really a bit of a quick and dirty lit review on my part that I might have thrown together at the last hour uh, of PhD. Um, it, it is complicated, especially when you look at places like um, Julia Creek. Um, so I think that was the first place I started looking and then I was like, what have I gotten myself into? Um, because uh, Julia Creek has a huge organic content um, that's obviously really strongly tied to the vanadium fixation in that area, which is now a vanadium mine. Um, so I didn't look at it in too much depth. There is not, there's a fair bit of black shale geochem. Um, and then, as I mentioned, a lot of people have looked at it in the past for charcoal counts. Um, in terms of present day, not something I've looked into specifically, sorry. Hi again. Um, this is probably a bit more of a, a general question, but obviously looking at your research, very sort of many skills and techniques you use there. Um, I guess just as a comment to the ECRs and the HDRs that might be online, how did you sort of um, plan your research in terms of using all those you know, multidisciplinary kind of techniques? Like, did you sort of start off with the plan that you were going to use sort of a few techniques for your characterization and then it kind of just grew? So I guess just talk us through how you you know, why you chose the techniques you did and how you integrated the data. I guess, you know, as people are sort of planning their research, probably curious, you know, oh my God, you did all these techniques, but you know, how did it all kind of come together? Yeah. So yeah, I, I, it started out with um, 
a plan like most things um, that sort of blew out of proportion. Um, so I started out just doing um, geochemistry, XRF, XRD. Um, I was really fortunate because at QUT we have a bench fee that means students can access the Central Analytical Research Facility, which is the CMM equivalent for free. Um, so you do all of your analysis yourself, you do all your sample prep yourself, or you, most of your data in, um, interpretation yourself, but you don't pay for it. So um, I was really fortunate in that respect that I had access to a lot of um, machines with big buttons and lasers and x-rays, and I didn't need a lot of funding for it. Um, and I think because of that, I probably also threw a lot of techniques at my work that haven't come to fruition. Um, so I did some stuff like Raman spectroscopy, which never even saw the light of day again. Um, so basically I started with XRD and um, some geochemistry and then just getting talking to people in the lab. Um, so I think one of the nice things about the academic culture and, and um, especially our lab technicians at QUT was once you get to know them, they'll write you an email and they'll say, hey, Christy, can you come by my office? I want to talk to you about your research. And then you sit down and you have a chat for three hours and they come up with all these really amazing ideas um, about how you can use their machines um, to give you more information. So, um, yeah, a, a lot of these things um, came from sort of a collaborative effort, I would say. Um, there were some really obvious analyses that I knew that I needed to do, like the SEM and the geochem. Um, and then a lot of the other really obscure ones came from the people that I met and the people that I talked to along the way who gave me really cool ideas about how to go forward with it. Really, a really good advice from technical staff. Do we have any more questions? Doesn't online seems to be um, fairly quiet. Anyone in the audience? I have another question myself, but it's more of a um, change of tact, I suppose. Um, so you showed the image of the Uluru and kind of like the incision. I, I thought that that was fascinating. Mm. I've never um, seen anything like that, but it also made me think um, there's a couple of uh, places in Western Australia, like the Wave Rock, Rock. which uh, I'm like, is that because of the wildfire? Because mm. I don't think anyone ever really um, speculated that, but I'm like, that looked yeah. very familiar, like really similar to what you showed about um, the picture you showed of Uluru, mm -hmm. um, is it? Well, that's a good question. So that, that was also my first thought when I, so that paper about the Uluru rocks falling only came out last year. Um, and that was my first thought. I saw that fled sloop and yeah. I'm from WA. I thought wave rock. Um, I, my understanding is that wave rock, they say is caused by the way the water erodes it, I think. Um, but yeah, it looks really similar. Uh, yeah, could it be rocks falling? Yeah, and I think um, the the people who did the study on Uluru went after a really recent fire, so there was still a lot of charred trees, and they could actually see um, the rock was blackened and that it was spalling away. Um, so do we need to go to Hyden after a fire? Maybe. I mean, it's not very interesting there, is that from Wave Rock? There's a lot of sheep, but <laughs> um, yeah. I think that's really interesting going forward cool. to look at. Yeah. A lot of questions. All right. Well, I guess on this note, we can wrap up. Um, all right. We have one announcement to make, and that's about the International Night that is on tonight from 6 to 10 p.m. Uh, here at the Indoor Pili Experimental Mine site. So all those who haven't purchased their tickets really should do it um, as soon as possible. And on the chat there, we've got the flyer and uh, more information about the International Night. And next week, we will continue with um, sort of a spontaneous spotlight on early career researchers here at the production centers. And we have um, Juliana Segura Salazar, who's one of the more recent additions to the JKMRC team and specifically the Development Minerals Program, which is not part of the JKMRC. Um, she will have a presentation on her PhD and postdoc research completed at the 
um, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, and as well as the Imperial College in London. And uh, her presentation is titled Sustainability Driven Innovations in Mining, a Systemic Perspective. So we will see you all then. And thank you, Christy, again. That was fast, fantastic. Thank you.